Department of Art at the University of New Hampshire. She completed her master's degree in visual studies and teaching at Tufts University and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Studio, uh, Tara remain, uh, maintains a vibrant studio practice in both New York City and in Exeter, New Hampshire, where she is also a professor of art at Phillips Exeter Academy. Tara paints contemporary figurative portraits that redefine pop culture icons, largely informed by a sustained exploration of her childhood memories of cartoons, MTV, and movies. Her evolving collection of paintings challenge conventional portraiture with a unique focus on female agency and contemporary complexities of the femininity. The paintings weave together fresh new narratives. To create her work, Tara uses digital photography, screen printing, and painting of, as part of her uh, artistic practice. She actively exhibits her work and participates in exciting art collaborations. Uh, she's active on social media. She's been included in exhibitions and events at the Aspen Art Museum in Aspen, Colorado, the Watermill Center in New York, the Louis K. Meisel Gallery, New York, New York. She's participated in Fashion Week. You've probably seen or followed her on Instagram. Um, she's widely exhibited and published in things like Culture Magazine, Women's Wear Daily, uh, L, Fine Art Connoisseur, and many other contemporary art publications. And I'm delighted to welcome Tara Lewis today. So thanks very much, Tara, for sharing your time with us. Well, thank you for inviting me to do this talk. It's a huge honor. I didn't think I'd ever be doing this. And um, I'm very excited to show you images I put together that kind of expand on things that Christina just said. So Christina, thanks again for that wonderful intro. Um, and I guess I can kick it off, right? Yep. All right. So I'm going to show you. Um, let's see. Can everybody see that? Christina, did that work? It did. It's it worked. Oh. OK, there I am. OK, so um, I'm going to show you a series of images. And I really like the things that Christina said um, about my work, because I'm very proud of the process that I've developed over the course of, I want to say, almost 15 years. Um, a new kind of um, studio practice and way of painting that I find really exciting and just an extension of who I am and my life experiences from childhood onward. Um, and it's just fun to connect the dots back to childhood experiences, because I do think when you're an artist, um, your work as an extension of yourself. And I think for me, that's just really extra <laughs> because I just remember all these interesting pop culture things that have found their way to um, my hands, a paintbrush and a canvas. Um, so I will dive right in. So this is a picture of me as a little kid repping my hometown with a sweatshirt back when they made sweatshirts for hometowns. Um, Kingston, New Hampshire is where I grew up and there's a little arrow to where it is in the state. And this is me, I'm just taking you through some of my these that jump out at me when I think, what was I like when I was little and how can I bring this to the now um, and relate it to my art? So I loved horses. I love that stuffed horse. I remember the gold uh, bridle and I am dressed up like I'm playing the role of the person who has the horse and loves the horse and rides the horse in my ranch outfit. Um, and that's little me on a huge animal. Um, but I really remember that being very focal in my childhood and just the whole role that cowgirls, cowboys, um, I wasn't from the West. So this was an interesting thing for me. And these are Smurfs. I know the slide talk, you're thinking, where are the paintings? What's she doing? Um, but these are really important. And my mother um, recently found me some Smurfs. I was having a bad day and she said, here's a bag of your Smurfs. And I thought, all right. Um, and I think they're really, really important because they're holding props. They are playing roles. Um, there are Smurfettes, which is great. That was a very forward thinking approach to making this toy. And I would collect these and be very excited about the tennis player or the drummer or whatever they were holding that gave them a new persona or identity. And these are, um, I'm definitely a John Hughes generation kid. So this Ferris Bueller, Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, I was born in 1970. So this is my teenage years. These films were so exciting to me. I still watch them. Um, and Xanadu, the first one was a movie I saw at a theater and it was Olivia Newton-John painted on a mural at the beach and she jumps out and comes to life. And I used to practice drawing those letters um, and trying really hard to make the proportions right. Because um, I lived in a small town 
back road and I really wanted to try things and, you know, draw things and try to get good at that because I knew I had that interest and that talent as a very little girl. And this was really pivotal. So the, the birth of MTV was huge for me. I remember the day it came on TV and suddenly like music that I used to make mixtapes and hit pause and hit record and all that. Now you could see the musician, you could see the, see the music. And the fact that there were these stories and little mini films being told, you know, I love Michael Jackson's thriller because it was like this small movie. And, and that was really exciting to me. Like, wait a minute, I'm visual, this is working. And I just love the graphics and the M and the T and the V and the way it was set up. Um, and just, it was just a huge impact on me. And then 17 Magazine and all the, I didn't have the internet, no one did. And um, there was a town library that had magazines. My sister had magazines. She was five years older, I was little. I love 17. Um, and I remember seeing this, I remember this very issue and I, of course, eBay has it for sale. I thought, good, I can grab that picture because I do remember this very issue um, and seeing it in the town library and the librarian, my mother doesn't know this story. The librarian said, well, you're not 17, you can't read that which makes you want to read it more, right? So I definitely um, remember learning about fashion, trends, coming of age topics and through magazines, TV, movies, et cetera. And this is me in middle school. So this is on here because I remember my mom was a teacher at the school I went to. And the principal, when asking my mom, you know, what does her want to do? And I loved school. I was academic. I wanted to be on the honor roll all the time and, and did get on the honor roll. And he said, oh, gosh, tell her, don't go into art. You won't be able to do anything with that. You know, you really should do something that pays you and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's really funny because I, I, I just didn't do that. I kept going with what I wanted to do um, with support from people around me. And it just was what I pursued anyway. So I feel like that's an exciting thing to reflect on. And I have my initials, which is actually TMI, which is too much information, which I'm gonna to try to avoid during this talk and move on to the painting soon. But um, that was a really pivotal thing in junior high. Um, my mother shared that story with me again recently. And okay, these are my, um, the big places I was at that really formed my art making and my professional life. And UNH was wonderful. Um, beautiful campus. The art building was the first time I'd used big studios and drew from life all these different objects. I could draw one object and I had teachers saying, draw all these objects together, learn proportions, drafting, et cetera, et cetera. And I really needed that um, fundamental foundation training. I really did. I just really felt like I was very self-taught in a lot of ways. I went to a small high school. I didn't get a lot of that kind of um, training. And so that was incredibly great to become a better draftsman, draftsperson, draftswoman. And then I worked at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston as a museum designer right out of college. And I did graphic design. I designed the banners, loved art, learned more about art history, realized when you work in a museum, you're in an office. I didn't know that. I thought I could sit in the galleries and look at the art. That's not what happens. But it taught me a lot about professional corporate working life and, um, and who I was and taking the subway and helping people on a team make these graphics, which was really neat. And um, I taught voluntarily art classes in the attic of the museum back then, little kids, and I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. So I decided to um, pursue a teaching degree at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, um, teaching masters to study that, and I learned so much about, wait, how can I take this thing I love and teach it, and then, you know, get a paycheck, get benefits, but also do something I love to do um, and grow from that. So that was a great, um, great education, such a phenomenal school right now, especially it's very vibrant and I still partake um, in alumni activities. And I've been teaching at Phillips Exeter for 22 years, I think. Um, so this is very, is a big part of who I am as an artist and um, as a teacher and a person and just keeps you young because working with high school kids definitely keeps you in the know and I, I value that tremendously. So process and studio practice, how I make a painting. There are little chapters to this um, presentation. So this is a bunch of images that have something in common, which is the font Cooper Black. I use this font in my work. It's everything from sea monkeys to the doors, Garfield, you've seen it, a vote for Pedro, um, but it's very common, um, iron on letters at the beach, velvet ones, if you're my age, you know what that is. Um, it's just a very, uh, it's been, been very pervasive in pop culture. And I lean to that when I make paintings. This is screen printing. And I use this process to make t-shirts that my models wear. And I make these, learned how to make them teaching at Exeter. I taught printmaking and thought, wait, how do I do that? I think that would be cool and taught myself and formed a class and then kind of incorporate that into my work. 
is the t-shirt on the left, um, one of my early attempts and experiments with making a shirt, um, the screen's behind you, and I put it on a model, and I tried to do an underpainting, and I thought, well, it's funny how it says ha ha ha, but who you are doesn't have to be what your shirt says, a book on, you know, the cover in the book. Um, you can't judge a book by its cover, and you can't necessarily expect a smile to be on a ha ha ha, you know, face. So. And these are two images of just more studio shots. This is actually jumping ahead a little bit, but a painting I did of another model in the shirt, experiments printing, my paintbrush is looking clean. I do keep them clean, very important. Um, and to the right is another experiment printing. I take pictures all the time. And it's really important to do. That's why I'm able to give you this talk today with all these pictures. So just a good tip. Okay, there's John Belushi in um, Animal House and there's a model I shot a picture of um, with a high school t-shirt. First time, I, this is kind of a breakthrough painting for me. That's a photograph on the right and just an outtake. I think it's a Polaroid actually um, of the model. I got a little um, tiara on Amazon. I tend to get props from Amazon. I bring them to the studio and I say to the model, put this on any way you want to. If you want to pick out something else and put it on, go ahead. So models that I photograph and paint do their own makeup. They touch their own hair. I don't touch them. They do the whole thing. They might pick a t-shirt that says this and not that. They might pick a wristband, but they're bringing themselves to it and they embody a theme that I tell them ahead of time. They know the concept, but they bring so much of themselves to it that it becomes spontaneous and you never know what might percolate and make a good painting because the model has this, they're empowered to really bring themselves to the image, to the role, to whatever you want to call it. But I really feel the person come through. And I recently talked to a new friend of mine who talked about power and strength being something that they noticed in my work. And I, I thought, oh gosh, that's so true. And I always forget to say that, like agency and, and confidence and individuality, but also strength and power. So I just, rem I think about that every day now. And this is the painting um, and a detail shot to the right of it called High School. Um, I like that Jim Belushi, John Belushi rather had the college shirt. And I thought, you know, just be like straightforward, generic. Generic is key in my work. I try not to put brands, but these items that are relatable, or maybe no matter what age you are, you can be like, oh, wait a minute, I've seen that before. Or oh, wait a minute, that headband reminds me of tennis. Or, you know, somebody can think about something. Um, but I thought this is a good starting point. The font just kills me. I mean, it's just bring, it's got a certain character to it, a certain life and a certain voice. Um, and this is the painting in a show. It sold at the show. I was really excited and very unexpected. This is in New York and Tribeca. Um, it was put in a group show and the scale you can see there much better. Um, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High was supposed to be called High School, the book. And I read the book by Cameron Crowe. He's a genius. He was an undercover reporter in high school and based the book on a true high school experience being undercover. Um, so he wanted it called High School. They said no for marketing, make it Fast Times. But I always liked the fact that he wanted to go to the generic mundane. This is me doing a split as a cheerleader as a kid. Cheerleading is another thing I absolutely loved um, and love the, gra the graphics on the uniforms, the letters, the megaphone, the props, the pom-poms, the teamwork, things like that, and the collaboration. I thought the whole thing was just super cool. And people older than me were doing it. I was like, hmm, that's so interesting. Um, I just thought it was great. And these are two paintings as a kid. I think we had the one on the left in my house, Losing the Game by Norman Rockwell and The Shiner by Norman Rockwell. And I love Norman Rockwell. And, and on the right, The Shiner, he actually, he crowdsourced for somebody in town with a good black eye so that he could paint a black eye effectively on a child. He, this kid didn't have a black eye, but he, he did, the more reading you do about paintings, the more ideas you get. And he definitely wanted to pose and kind of curate the way this looked, this idea he had in his head into a painting of a girl with a shiner near the principal's office. Um, I think she's pretty naughty. But um, the fact that he wanted that perfected and had all these people come to him and say, we have black eyes, what do you think? Pick the best one. Um, I think that's really a neat approach to making a painting and the process wise. And I love this piece. It's a sculpture by Dwayne Hansen. It's realistic, photorealistic um, of a cheerleader. It's actually his daughter, but I love that she's not rah, 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 she's just standing there looking at you and doing everything opposite of what cheerleaders are stereotypically um, expected to do. This is a painting I did as a result. A lot of these paintings are overlaps and things that I say. Um, that's a cheerleading skirt that you can get online, um, a wristband. The model brought that, I have a lollipop, she opened it, she put it there. Um, the pose, the hair, everything is the model's choice. Um, Gloria Steinem lipstick colors were the love, love, love hues. And those are actually glasses that Gloria Steinem had, they're Cartier's that I got from the real, real and had this very 
the very symbolic props that maybe you don't glean that initially because the whole painting is kind of contemporary meets classical background dark. Um, but again, I document the paintings as JPEGs too. So I always have these to show. If you're a student, that's so important to do, by the way. Um, and then cheerleaders continue. The gestures on the right are photographs I took. On the left is the painting. But you can see the model kind of does what she wants to do. She does poses. I take about 200 to 600 pictures, probably more. And I look through them and see what happened after. Another pose from that. And again, the lighting on the face and even the skirt. I'm very deliberate with lighting. I paint from photographs. Um, and I think that's just fine because I need to see light and curate it and direct it and make sure it's exactly what I want it to be before I start the painting and the expression and the whole pose sort of clicks. And this is me with a little uh, Halloween costume, cut out the eight. I wanted to be a track star. There's a headband. And then on the right, I'm Zorro or Lone Ranger or something. But I remember these costumes vividly. Um, I didn't put them on thinking, oh, when you're over, I'm 50, going to be 53 soon. When you're 50 something, you're going to paint, you know, Lone Ranger. It's not, you know, it's funny to look back now and think that I just did that intuitively, but um, those iconic kind of figures are interesting to me. Um, Lone Ranger is a guy and I wanted to flip the gender to be a female Lone Ranger. The cheering skirt makes an appearance again, the headband. Um, but I've done a few Lone Ranger paintings and I got the hat on Amazon, the whole costume, the mask and I'm still working with the mask and the, um, the different accessories from that, but changing the gender was important to me. These are details of the painting um, that I've kept these on my website too. I think it's important to put those on your website and show people detail shots. You never know when you might need them. This is me in the second grade, and this is really important um, to me and relates to my process. I went to school and I remember they combed my hair with the unbreakable comb at school picture day. I was fine, I love my rugby, and they combed through each side. You can see where the comb was. And I remember being really upset with that because I had, was fine with how it was. And um, my face shows that. So this taught me, let the model do their own hair. So again, individuality is another recurring theme. And process-wise, sometimes I do sketches, I look at the palette, um, color interaction, I invent the color backgrounds. I tend to do solid backgrounds to call attention to the model. Um, and capture the details that I'd like to capture and um, bring that to it. This is all of this love um, with the wristband. The, this model brought all of her own um, personal agency to the shoot. And she put that pop in her mouth and made the hand gesture. Um, and the whole thing just kind of clicked. That was the last picture I took in the shoot. And I thought, yep, that's it. That's the scale of it. And it's hoping to go to a gallery someday, but sitting in the studio in, in New York. And this is, um, on, in the center is a painting and on the right are some outtakes. And this girl I found on the street leaving a gallery and my husband said, run and go get her. Cause I said, I think I wanna paint her. Gave her my business card and she got in touch with me. And then I found out she was um, a Harvard grad who ran track, track star. Also um, was on Project Runway as one of the models. So you never know who you might meet, but this is a oh video. The boxy a video of the shoot or thing actually looked cool. Yeah, because you can see. It. Yeah, it kind of like and it's fun. So it pulls away from your leg on one side. Yeah, that's cool. Nice. Oh, that's funny. And then there's a shadow. The ball makes this like a yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, the, the interaction with the ball is really fun. And then if you like, yeah, then make the ball go like straight up. Yeah, exactly. Right, because then I would fall. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny. That's how uh, things the ha 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 works. So like, oh, what the hell? So you can't really so. like that. And then a woman in New York who's um she's I think a trustee at the Brooklyn Museum goes to exhibits and she recreates paintings. She's done hundreds of these on Instagram. Carla Shen, follow her. It's a riot. And she went to the gallery when I had this work in the show on the Lower East Side, and she posed exactly like this, found my shirt on the real reel because it was a collaboration with a fashion designer. And um, I saw this come up on Instagram and thought, oh my gosh. Um, and it was Art News, editor's picks of 19 things not to miss in New York that week. So I thought, whoa, it's just amazing how one painting can have a trajectory that you don't expect it to have. And there's the model visiting the, the painting. And the same model as a prom queen. I love flipping the prom queen on its head. It's a t-shirt, it's a cheap tiara. Um, and a woman of color as prom queen after all the movies I saw as a teenager. Um, I just wanted to represent and reboot that whole stereotype. And just the word prom simple, another painting. 
same theme, a detail shot, a detail cropping rather of a painting. So I like to be experimental. I printed the sash instead of a t-shirt and had an auto body award instead of like a beauty queen on the trophy. I ordered trophies and kind of put the wrong, a different top on the top, but again, detail shots. Props are important to me. I order props from Amazon and the model just kind of uses the prop the way they want to. Lightning bolt earrings, lollipops, um, happy sticker. She turned it upside down. Those are her grandmother's pearls. And it's sort of, you know, this debutante gone, you know, not looking perfectly smiling, perfect hair, etc. And I just love the styling of this and the mood and the color and whatnot. It's also the homepage of my website. If you're an artist, it's good to have good pictures. Western Barbie. Um, this is an exciting project. I always write up something about each painting just for me. And if you enter, um, if you apply for a grant or if a gallery wants a little write up of each painting or they're trying to sell them, I just email them the text. It's good to have that. It's also good like cognitively to do that and know why you're making a painting, what it's about. Then a painting comes from a painting. So as you keep making them, you have this body of work that leads to the next thing like anything. Um, so Western Barbie is, I remember the commercials when I was little and the hat of course is like the hat you've seen already. This is the Here's the Western Barbie. Beautiful Western Barbie. Let's pretend everyone wants Barbie's autograph. She's a Western star. Yeah. Western Barbie comes with an autograph stamp that works. Neat. When you press her back, she winks. Can I have your autograph, ma'am? Sure, partner. No, Dad. <laughs> New Western Barbie doll comes with an autograph stamp, a Western outfit, and all you see here from Mattel. So that Western outfit was huge to me. So I, the hat that I have is like the clip you saw at the end of that little um, commercial for Western Barbie. Thank God for YouTube, I can find this stuff. And um, so I had a, a colleague, a teaching colleague who desperately wanted to be part of a collab, like a, a painting. And I thought, oh gosh, she's gonna be great. And um, I got a pink backdrop, Barbie pink. She actually collects Barbies, which is interesting. And she's really into Barbie now and Barbie's doing incredible things um, if you look up the latest, greatest Barbies. Um, they're becoming very forward thinking and contemporary and very tuned in. And I thought she'd be a great person. She had, blonde, her hair changes changed every few weeks and the blonde appeared. And I decided, <clears throat> she, what, let's do Western Barbie. So I printed the shirt and then the hat and she kind of adorned herself with like a pink and a blue heart choker. And of course I had, I had a pile of 30 different things and she just grabbed these few things. You never know what the models are gonna grab and that's great. Um, and a spiked bracelet, so, oops. Oh. And these are, this is how I, um, I should really talk about what you're looking at. Um, these are photos in Bridge, which is a Photoshop program. So I look at all the photographs. I decide which one might be a good painting. This is a drawing that I did. I didn't paint that, but I did draw that as kind of a first round of like, well, that, that's interesting, very direct. And then I did a painting on the left. It's actually like an old Western photo. Um, I never colorized it. I might someday, but I kind of liked that it felt like suede. Um, and on the right is a drawing I did as a result. And then she wanted to, this is her idea to throw the whole trophy wife on its head. Um, and I do watch The Real Housewives. I think watching TV is good. You know, if you If it's not the highest quality show, it's fine. You might get ideas. Um, but I do think that there's um, cultural significance in a lot of that stuff. So she, this was her idea to collaborate on this shirt. So sometimes the model comes to me and says, hey, if we're doing a shoot, can we do this one too? And I thought, sure, no problem. So um, she just liked the idea that it would be redefined. And this is another process shot of a painting called Swimmer. It's a model who took her hair down out of these little buns and then it was all wet and jelly and strange. And I thought, oh, okay, that's fine. Let's just make a swimmer um, portrait out of that. So again, like there's, this is the stage where I sketch on the canvas and then there's some underpainting and then it becomes color. That's a smaller work. There's a detail shots up close that lighting is so important to me. And I do like classical painters a lot and how they make realistic paintings. Americana Cowboy, this is a, another cowboy hat, but red, white, and blue, and a model that I am friends with, and I thought I would maybe depart from females and see what it would be like to paint somebody <clears throat> who brought themselves to it in an idea. So I actually said to, to Nico, what can we put on a t-shirt? And he said, well, how about not a t-shirt? Let's do a tank top. And Mr. Americana speaks to his Black heritage and etc. He <clears throat> really wanted that to be celebrated in the work with the same props I usually use in my painting. So at this point, I've been developing a certain aesthetic that was known by people and friends and people that wanted a painting created. And Mr. Americana, this is the, the final work I did from that. 
again, steps to a painting, you see the pencil, it builds up. There's no earring. Now there's an earring. I'll do that again. And there's a lightning bolt earring, which has been in past paintings. And I thought, I didn't know what to do with this painting. It stuck around for a long time. And I decided to make a girl with a lightning bolt earring, kind of inspired by a girl with a pearl earring from 1665, like, whoa, that's a long time ago. That painting's amazing. And I thought that would be kind of a neat um, redo of that. In Botticelli, um, I made a painting called American Venus, and this is the birth of Venus. And my painting, this is actually a detail shot of the head, and this is the twisties I was talking about with the hair. And this is the final piece, and candy cigarettes are in the bikini, um, and it's just sort of an uh, American version of, of that iconic um, painting. Jaws, uh, the book is great, the movie's great, the, the made a shark trophy, found a bathing suit, um, but this is really about feminism and about female agency predominantly, um, and this shows you scale. This trophy is going to be in a future painting, um, constructed the trophy with a little rubber shark, and um, the blue background was a choice because, of course, the ocean and um, the posters on the bathing suit, which has graphics on it that are very intentional. This is my studio. Okay, this is actually this is a studio in New York, and it's all got lots of stuff in it. And then there's piles of paint um, and books. I love art books so much. I could do a whole presentation on art books. I love, but that's another presentation. Okay, art collaborations and special projects. So I've done. Um, Lots of projects that are really kinetic. I think if you're an artist, it's important to work with other people. Don't stay in a room alone. Go see art shows. Go learn more about what's going on. But also um, participate in things that help other people. Um, I think that's critical. So Between the Lines is a coloring book that RX Art, it's a nonprofit in New York, um, publishes every couple of years. And they invite contemporary artists to contribute drawings to the book. And typically, it's really quite the roster of contemporary artists that do this, like Rob Pruitt does um, drawings for it and Jonas Wood and different artists. If you follow contemporary art, it's really a cutting edge publication and it's given to hospitals um, and there's sponsorship like Warby Parker and the Keith Haring Foundation sponsored it, this particular volume. Um, and it goes to hospital pediatric wards for students, uh, students, sorry, um, for patients to color. And they also have made MRI machines, have a Jeff Koons monkey on it um, and really make hospitals a nicer place to be for um, children that have to be in them. So I contributed to sketches. Um, I was invited to do this. And a color, this coloring book definitely is contemporary. It's not meant for little, little kids only to color, um, but it can be. So I took two photos that I took and I made um, these ink sketches of them. And based on, that's a sketch I did and I kind of translated it into um, a linear piece with a pen. And the two drawings were auctioned off at a benefit and the money went back to RX Art. So I learned a lot about how a nonprofit works and how your art can actually help <clears throat> help people. And I actually did a coloring book when I was at UNH and have since um, about New England, about, uh, Kingston, my town I grew up in. So coloring books are pretty cool. Um, just wanted to plug coloring books. Okay, the Museum School in Tufts, wonderful um, thing that they do every year is the art sale and it's to raise money for scholarships to help students who need money for supplies like I did and um, for um, various needs for incoming students and, and I think it's a wonderful program. They sell paintings and there's, um, I think it's maybe, I don't know how many days in a row, like a long weekend or something. Um, and the money, um, some money goes to the artist, some money goes to the school. Um, sometimes the artist donates a piece entirely to the school. So all the money goes to the school. Sometimes it's 50% goes to the artist, but it's a great way to like have your art um, participate and give back to, um, to a school that was really quite wonderful, so. I like to participate in that each year, but you can see the painting that you saw, Western Barbie was in that sale, um, along with others every year I do it. And again, they ask for um, good advice if you're an art student, they ask for um, scale shots. So I always take a picture of my paintings with objects around it. So you know how big the painting is if you're somebody who might buy it, right? So you have to be always thinking about that if you're in interested in selling your paintings. Um, all these things are so, so important. The Watermill Center in New York is an art center. I was invited to contribute a piece to their benefit auction. Again, that gives back to an art center that's in Watermill um, on Long Island. And the auction was sponsored by Artsy and that painting sold. It's now at the Bunker Art Space in Miami. It was purchased by um, a major collector, which is exciting. And Intersect Aspen is an art fair. I did that during COVID. It was remote and I had work <clears throat> online. That was a tricky time, but actually an exciting time for artists because the online 
um, community became very robust. And this is a collaboration I did during Fashion Week, not during Fashion Week, with, with a fashion designer that was shown during Fashion Week. Millie is a brand that was formerly owned by Michelle Smith, a designer. There she is on the left. And she, we both decided, I approached her, and we decided to make a t-shirt and sweatshirt line to be meshed with kind of like skirts and higher end things. So um, she came over, and we she had never screen printed before. And we made t-shirts, and um, prototypes went down the runway. And there's a painting in the background. Yeah, girl. So that's actually like, it's fun to see the work go down the runway. I actually saw that live, not seeing the pieces until they actually walked right by me. Um, so seeing, making the work with her, collaborating on a t-shirt, and making, seeing it on a runway is a way to see your art take a whole new medium form. It's wearable, it's on someone, and it was a creative collab that was uh, truly exciting. <laughs> Can't get away from that. Okay. And then it was interesting. This is unexpected and kind of cool. Online, I saw things pop up, like Vogue covered it, and they used my, my des our design um, as the featured image. And then New York Times actually photographed the one in the center is a colored um, ha 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 that you saw earlier. And then again, more press um, and interviews that happen. So I thought, whoa, this is exciting. One thing can lead to another thing, lead to another thing. This woman had the sweatshirt on in front of the Metropolitan Museum and tagged me and I thought, oh my goodness, it's out there. So um, and that is Madison Avenue. The store put it in the window and the woman working actually had it on. And I thought, my goodness, this is way too exciting. Um, but yeah, one thing does lead to another. Aspen Art Crush is an annual benefit for the museum. And the money goes back to the museum and um, they invite artists to come to Aspen for a weekend and there's a Sotheby's sponsored auction and the work is in the collector's homes. So you get to see art and the collectors support the artists. It's kind of like summer camp for artists. I found it supportive and a great learning experience. And I brought dresses, which was like, wow, okay, I gotta find a dress. Um, so all these experiences definitely are kinetic. They get you meeting people. And this was especially exciting um, to meet collectors and learn why they collect art and meet other artists. So I did a collaboration with Brooke Shields. Um, I reached out to her as a childhood you know, icon. I knew about her. I loved the jeans and I thought she was incredibly interesting um, as a model. And so I reached out to her and she talked to me and wanted to do a collaboration. I thought, oh, well, I was just going to paint her. And she brought my, way more to it than I thought. Again, the spirit of collaboration with the models is key. Um, and it was shown at my Zell Gallery in New York. These are ads, if you've never seen them. They're very iconic from 1981, when je designer jeans were like the thing. And this is from the shoot I did. Um, Studio 50, we actually pre-met about the shoot and Studio 54 was part of her childhood bubblegum. She would go there as a little, as a kid, she wasn't partaking in the debauchery. She was very um, much a child who looked older than she was and talked to me about that. And so we pulled together looks. She brought things, I brought things. Um, chocolate everywhere. That's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, look at that. Ah, that's like the bubble Olympics. <laughs> It is the Bubble Olympics. So I decided to paint a bubble. We actually collaborated on a few of the paintings I did. Um, it shows you the progression of this painting, which is fairly large. It's a 60 inches long, full body. Um, and then I found works that are related to it. Robert Maplethorpe, a photograph, which is eerily similar. And um, Barclay Hendricks did a great painting of just a relaxed pose with the bubble. Um, and I like to find things that are make my painting a little bit derivative. You know. And we made a zine. If anybody's seen a zine, we folded these up and printed over, I think hundreds of them actually to give out at the show. You get a little poster that unfolds, which was neat too. Um, again, a jeans ad. She donated jeans to the Met. She has two pairs. She brought the other pair to the studio. This is the ad. And fun. Ooh, this is the ad that um, one of the paintings was based on. If I could make that work, I apologize. Oh my goodness. And finally, by natural selection which filters out those genes better equipped than others to endure in the environment. This may result in the origin of an entirely new species, which brings us to Calvin's and the survival of the fittest. Calvin Klein genes. 
What's interesting is that this ad is actually, they talk about genetics and genes, and she brought the actual genes from this ad, from this commercial, to my studio and put them on her daughter and recreated the ad, which is like genes and genes. So I call the, um, the painting is called Survival of the Fittest, which was actually the name of the commercial too. So there are all these layered meanings. Underpainting, I screen printed the Calvin Klein in Photoshop. I made sure it was at the right angle. Again, these are detail shots. She brought her own earrings. She's in junior high school. So I think she was going to a sleepover that night, but we made this happen. Um, again, references. Cron Cardi was a doll, the Brooke Shields doll. Um, this, it's funny, I talked to Brooke about all these ideas and they're really interesting, but this is her actual prom dress. They made one for the doll and she brought the prom dress to, over to the studio as well. So the bottom row um, is the dress on her daughter. And I love this photo of Marilyn Monroe. It's an outtake, it's natural. It's kind of like earlier work I did. And I just loved one of the poses. She's standing there in the dress and I think her mom was trying to tie the back into a bow and she was just like, she had had it. You know, she just wanted to go to the sleepover. And I love capturing that real moment. The realness in my paintings is so appealing to me. These are more paintings from the, the show. This is all online too, portraits. And here's the show itself in Soho at Lou and Mizell Gallery, which is, a, it was a very large show. Um, and here's a final picture. We had David Kratz, the president of the New York Academy of Art, um, was a moderator for a talk we did about the work where Brooke and I talked about the whole experience of the collaboration and um, the resulting paintings. This was a three-year three year project. It was not, didn't take overnight. It was a long, a lot of um, painting and a lot of discussions and planning. So Artnet News um, interviewed um, her and interviewed me. And what I love is that one of the questions was, what are some of the props or clothing you brought to the studio? That's what all of my models do. So it's kind of fun to see that that studio practice is really becoming more honed. Um, and the practice, more practice, the more conditioned you get and the stronger you get and more focused. So I just liked the fact that an article kind of brought together all these conversation pieces into one kind of symbiotic thing. And then it was fun to see it appear everywhere. I thought that was really neat that my painting got in there online and people in page six and they referenced my name in the gallery and whatnot. So it's just kind of far reaching fingers. It was a really exciting project with really nice people. Exhibitions and collections. I'm, I know I'm maybe going to go over five minutes. I'm so sorry, but I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, I had a show on the Lower East Side in this space with other artists, a group show. Um, a woman contacted me on Instagram, wrote an email, and I thought, you know, what the heck, I'll do it. And it ended up being a really interesting little show in a very small gallery. Um, people looked at the work, and it led to another, that's at UNH. This is the Museum of Art, right, a show of my work from uh, being a grant finalist. Show scale, again, in galleries. This is Lions Weir Gallery, and that little Lower East Side show led to the director of this gallery seeing my work by walking by. And then he said, hey, we'll give you a solo show. And this is an established gallery in Chelsea. And I thought, yeah, wow, this is really cool. Um, so one thing leading to another is, is something to really think about um, and being open to talking to people. What's neat is that I was asked to kind of activate this little nook um, that you see on the right with anything I wanted. So I made wallpaper of all these words and idioms that I've put on t-shirts in different colors. So wallpaper kind of activates that space and the painting being in it was a great kind of installation piece. I never thought I'd do an installation like that. And on the left are like things from my studio. And he said, just bring in everything you want and put it on the wall, make it like a little studio in the gallery. And I thought, this is fun. So that collaborative spirit was definitely a learning experience for me. And a collector bought the wallpaper and the painting to put in their house, which I never thought that was for sale, but I thought there it is. So I learned that too, that you can actually um, create something like and that somebody would install in there living space. Um, an article about the show, this painting um, sold and this painting, this is some, good advice for artists. That's 70 inches high. So it's a little bigger than usual. Doesn't really fit in the car. It had to be shipped somewhere. So that was tricky. So was, you got to think about things ahead of time. The logistics it had to be dropped off at a certain shipper, arranged through the collector. But all these little things I've learned by kind of jumping into the ocean of this and swimming and getting help from my husband, especially, and um, trying to navigate through how do you get your work prepared and how do you make it archival and how do you wrap it and how do you make it safe and transport properly and all those things that you never thought you'd have to buy that much packing tape in your life. Um, again, drawings I did that are in. Um, Collector's homes, I think it's fun to look at these 
and see where they live. This collector is in New York and this painting is in the same collection as a Chuck Close. And I thought that was so cool. Um, and I got permission to use these photos online, of course. So these are two other um, paintings and situations in their homes, their new homes. The latest, okay, I'm working on this new thing. I'm actually not too bad with time. Um, I'm diving into this Looney Tunes thing now. Fast and Furious was the first one. First cartoon of um, Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. Trump Loy and its fungus. So I had a model watch that and a model I've used before. I love this. There's such potential for a painting with this with a model in front of it. And I'm thinking solid backgrounds, maybe need to, maybe I need to try something new like a landscape. And I thought, well, I don't really paint landscapes. So I paint what I wanna paint and I like figures and fashion and trends and pop culture. So I thought, wait a minute, I love this whole combination of the Looney Tunes and what the, the idea of the road runner kind of always winning stealthily and Acme Corporation, all these things don't kill the Roadrunner because there's Roadrunner strong and make the Roadrunner a girl and make bring all these props I've used before with new ones. And I started building things. So I built this little Acme bomb. This is a studio um, in Exeter and little Acme bomb. And I painted this paintbrushes in the cartoon. If you look carefully, it was green. I paused all the frames and the paint bucket I put tape on and spray painted red and white, red and white. Um, there's a shark trophy. And so I took some pictures and these actually will be like with that trompe background, I'm hoping. So it will be, you know, figure in this cartoon um, space. I haven't made it yet, but you can follow my Instagram and see how it comes out. And there's a show in Brooklyn that I have April 23rd that will have these paintings um, featured, I hope. And again, there's the beep beep. And then that's this really iconic splat um, and the little bomb, so. And there's cake with instead of a candle on top, there's an Acme um, bomb there. And again, I brought back some of the other familiar um, props and styling elements and the Acme core t-shirt. Um, the model cut the shirt. You know, I usually let them kind of affect things. I didn't say tie that red thing to your leg. I didn't say put your knee bent like that. I don't do that. I just see what happens. So this is a background I really liked. And then there's a figure in it. I do these experiments in Photoshop and we'll see what happens. But I think it's good to just keep progressing. Um, these are little painting. This is an inst this is my photo reel on my phone. It's an Instagram post. Instagram could have been a whole presentation. It's so powerful. Um, and really, it, the art world lives on Instagram. Um, so that's just, I can't say that enough. I meet the best people through that. Um, the UNH, I'm going to end with this. UNH, um, I, two or three years ago during COVID, I was just at home and looked up UNH's art department and they asked for um, alum to submit your spotlight and I thought I'll do it. So this has been on there for a while. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but they ask you all these questions and it was really neat. And so how, doing this talk with you has been extremely fun because I really answered these with time and care, realizing that it wasn't being sent to anybody, but maybe somebody would read it and now I'm able to give a talk. So hopefully students will see some of this. Um, so I like this as kind of to move something as kind of a last slide. So what advice do you have for students in your field? So I wrote this, meet other artists and visit their studios. And there is not one way to paint and lots of materials out there. Support other artists and go to their shows. Apply for things that constantly, apply for things constantly and expect to get a rejection most of the time. By the way, I get two a week. Um, don't try to conform to an application or call for entries. Figure out what you do and how you do it and what it's about, and it'll happen naturally. Let life experience and personal interests inform your work. I love fashion magazines and pop culture, I always have. My work is prompted by this and it's super valid. Galleries are all very different from one another, just like clothing stores. Look around, read a lot, go to New York City, see shows in museums, at uh, museums and galleries. Boston has an art scene as well. Most cities do, also small communities do, small towns. And above all, keep making work so it can evolve, stay conditioned, I love this last part. Cold starts are awful. Being an artist is like being an athlete. It's so true, like anything, you need to stay conditioned. So I like that connection to um, athletics. And I think this is my last slide. So if you wanna follow me, you can, if, unless you already do. And um, thank you so much for listening. And it's 4.47, not bad. I'm done. So do I, 
You have to stop sharing your screen. Okay. There we go. Great. Okay. That was a wild ride. That was great. It was like a marathon. Yeah, it was definitely a marathon. I just wanted to finish. And thank you. Yeah. So we'll give people an opportunity. If you have any questions for uh, Tara, just remember to type them into the chat and I will uh, toss them over to you. So while we're waiting for some of those questions, I was wondering, you've just recently moved your studio from New York to Exeter. You're super connected. You've made a lot of contacts through your time in New York, just people off the street. But talk to the challenges about um, establishing a new studio and developing a new artistic community for yourself in Exeter. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think I've had that community from being at Phillips Exeter for 22 years. So there's definitely familiarity. I'm from the area as well. Um, and I honed my studio practice down there. So I, it wasn't that hard um, to, I did, I had a studio in New York in my apartment. Then it's in, you know, a space in Tribeca. Then it's in another room, you know. So I, I think if you have a wall or like a space, your studio can be anywhere. And really your studio is in your head. So you and you bring the creative piece of you. So it wasn't that hard to kind of, this is a physical aspect, of course, but mm -hmm. I think once you get set up again, you just kind of go. I think being versatile, flexible, et cetera, is like, is paramount. Um, yeah, so I think it's good to hit reset and be in different environments or you might get stuck. You know, you might get too comfortable and too familiar and then you get in a rut. So I, I think disruption is healthy, actually. Okay. Um, and I thrive on chaos, so I guess it works for me. But um, yeah, it's exciting to me. I haven't really, I've been underwater finishing paintings for a show. I haven't really met new people, but there's such a um, a great culture up here in terms of visual art. And I know in Maine, there's some fun stuff. There's a show in Kittery, uh, um, Bowie Gallery, mm -hmm. and I have a piece in there and it, all the work gets in, no one gets rejected. Like, I love that. So um, really just jumping into any other exhibit situation or um, call for entries or a studio visit is great. There are open studios at the the space my studio is in on Friday nights, first Friday of every month. So um, yeah, I haven't had time to sink my teeth in, but I'm definitely... Um, always optimistic. That's just me, glasses half full. Good. Well, you spoke about um, various ways that you've been engaged with and partnerships or collaborations. And I wonder if you could very pragmatically speak about that, what that process is like for you. What kind of protections do you have in place as an artist so that your work isn't ripped off, that you don't place something and, and not get it back? How... Everything is a little bit different, but I was just wondering if you could sort of speak about, do you have a contract? What's covered? How do you navigate these collaborations that have a commercial dimension? Oh, they're all different, right? I mean, it's, it's that's so interesting because I don't have any big, like, I didn't study that. I just, you just kind of dive in and you have to just keep your wits and protect yourself. One thing I didn't bring up, which relates to your question indirectly, um, I shoot all my own photographs. So that way they're mine. And I don't have, I don't ever use anybody else's photographs because that I've always known that that bleeds into a place where it's not, A, it's not mine. There's no connection to it. B, um, legally that's, that's trouble. If I sell a painting, uh oh, whose image is that? You know, and it's valid. They want part of the money or it's whatever. Um, great question. Um, yeah. So I have signed, you know, um, agreements with galleries before a show, there's insurance, you see shipping, you might have to pay half. Um, when it comes to, for example, the Brooke Shields collaboration, I mean, that was just um, from the heart. You know, she wanted to do it and said, you know, you can, um, the deal was I would give her a free painting and she would give me, I could have rights to those photographs the rest of my life, you know, so you, everybody's different. So that was what we agreed on. We had coffee. It was very human, very real, very nice, very kind, very authentic. Um, and just for the spirit of collaboration and no profit necessarily was involved with that. Um, when I worked with the gallery for that show, we communicated about the fact that I would be working with the gallery on showing that work. And then I would get a certain percentage of the sales, which was um, 50%. Okay. So the galleries take 20% off. Um, that gallery would, if they did give the discount, they would keep that part of the money and I would get 50. So um, that I've seen that standard in New York is 50%. So you have to mark your work accordingly. Um, otherwise you just have to be careful of your right of your, just to talk and communicate before you dive into something. There's okay. a lot of, strange things out there. <laughs> this, is kind of a, this is a follow-up to that question. And this is coming from Julie Holcomb, who teaches photography here. Mm -hmm. And many of her students are on this call. 
And her question is about using imagery and iconography from the Warner Brothers cartoons. Oh. And do you worry about copyright infringement with that? That's really interesting. That you know, I don't, um, because I think when it's something I could look into, I think, um, and I will look into it. That's uh, somebody else has brought that up to me as well. Um, if I showed the cartoon in a gallery on the screen, that's bad, right? Okay. That's not. Um, I think if something is in the context of the work that you make and your your studio practice and how you make paintings and why you make them. And I create my own little Acme bomb, and it, it's in it's we're more about female um, empowerment or you know what's the message in the painting. I'm not trying to sell Acme. I don't know if I'm saying this right. I, I think as long as it's the percentage is more leaning to what my work's about and the greater message, it's usually okay. Um, I make the t-shirt beep beep is, you know, I, that isn't necessarily owned by them alone. Um, I may use my own font. I've used that font all along. So in a way I've branded myself um, in terms of what my aesthetic is, the paintings? That's a great question, actually. And I, I will uh, thank you because I will definitely look into that. Um, but the way I paint something, I'm not using the photograph. I showed some mock-ups, but I definitely use painterly elements. Um, I do think it's good to alter and make it translate it on your own. Um, art, art does come from art. I think being derivative is valuable. Um, I mean, Richard Prince is behind me. So he's he's the the king of misappropriation, right? Um, but and using other people's images and he's been sued. But I think in the context I do it with my model and what the originality they bring to it, I, I don't fear that, but I, I do keep an eye on that and look into it, so. Okay. With every work I do. Yeah, and usually a gallery will flag that too. A gallery will say, wait a minute. And that, that the zine we made with Brooke had elements of Keith Haring, we took those out. Okay. Because we thought, whoa, no. So yeah, I think just talking with the venue it might go to is important too, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Richard Prince behind you. Could you um, identify the dogs behind you? Oh, yeah, those were um, the, it's actually a wedding present. Uh, William Wegman, the photographer, um, gifted that to my husband and to me. It's two. It's a sea print. It's a, two dogs in Maine with like little daisies around them. Um, it's like, you know, the if you could see it up close, it's like a larger dog, smaller dog. It's like a little couple. Uh, <laughs> so he that was... Um, I guess, and he was a visiting artist at Exeter and somebody that um, we've maintained a good relationship with. And he's just such a sweet person who's done really wonderful things in terms of his art being in children's books and um, Sesame Street. And then of course, high art, fine art too. So yeah. yeah. Well, somebody had asked in the chat, what are the, what's the art oh. that you do? So they wanted to know. Great. And that, that's my, my husband's photograph from out West. And those are my paintbrushes, yeah. I did a little bit of background styling, not too much. This is usually what's up on the wall, but thank you for asking. You're welcome. Um, I'm also wondering if you could talk a little bit about something we touched on when you and I had met, and that was the intentionality that you have when it comes to studio visits. So you spoke about very deliberately reaching out to different kinds of galleries, different places, and showing them your work and Maybe you could just talk to the students who are on this call about the process that you went through, the plan that you put in place, and when you got positive feedback, how you prepared for those visits. Such an excellent question. Um, there should be a panel about this, honestly, like different artists talking about this. I think it's different for everybody. My experience has been, um, if I had a show with Lou Mizell Gallery, and people from that gallery said, we want to do a studio visit because you have a show coming up. And that made sense because it's a very connected to something we were planning. Um, they initiated that. Then I, I'm a little bit of a think big person. So I invited people to my studio from major galleries. One begins with a G and they came over directors. And um, I thought, this is fantastic. I'll get feedback. It might not be what I want to hear. It might fall dead on the ground. I just dove in there and thought, why not? Let's just try it. What's the worst that's going to happen? They don't like the work, you know. I like it. I'm okay. Um, and I, it's funny because when you reach out like that and cold, kind of oh. cold ball, but somebody to come over, I, I, I immediately went into nervous mode and started cleaning, like a little, and making it set up like a gallery. And I've worked in, I worked at the UNH Museum 
um, as when it was a gallery when I was, so I, I've got that whole gallery thing in me and thought of make it look nice. And, you know, I really should have just left it messy and how it was. I, that, that, I wish I could go back in time and do that because it just took a little bit of my little craziness out. And I was too like, Ooh. um, always have water, always have little peanuts. Don't open the water, have a seal on it. So they know that nobody did anything to it. And, um, little things I learned. And yeah, I think it's funny though. Um, like I, all the studio visits I've had have been very supportive, but I'll have one painting on the wall and hear five different interpretations of it that are whole, like, so different, you know, they'll say, oh, what is that about? People have their own ideas about what the work is about or, oh, why isn't it like this? Or why didn't you do that? Or, and I think it's just good to hear it all and take it in. I really do. And not just be like, well, I'm right. Cause I, I, I think feedback is important. Taking critical feedback as a teacher, I ask people to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I've, I've heard different interpretations of my work that are really, I mean, whoa, you know, and, and people will say, what is the latest thing you're working on? That's been the constant question. And I set it up so nicely you couldn't tell. And you really want to make sure it looks like an active space that you, okay, this is the painting I'm working on now. It's not done. The paint's out, that's good. Like that's somebody visiting. That's literally a visit, right? But yeah, I think um, that's good advice too, is just be yourself, just keep it yourself. Everybody who walks in is gonna have a different intention. A commercial gallery, they make money. That's what they do. So, and you make the art. So they're trying to find a click maybe, or something that might work. They wanna know what you might be doing next. They wanna know what, what your work's about. It's good to have a sound bite. It's good to have something quick to say. Um, yeah, and it's good to have paintings stacked on the floor. I mean, don't, it's okay. They might wanna grab one and flip through them. You know, they might wanna see some sketches and you can, so I think it's good to just don't, just don't plan too much. Mm -hmm. I really would love to rewind time a few times, <laughs> you know, but I'm glad I had the experience. Um, but yeah, just be yourself and don't don't try too hard. Just be you. Pretend it's a family member coming over or a friend. Tara, that is great advice because some of the students on here may be uh, approaching time for their crits when they come back from spring break. Right. So um, good advice for, for the students on the call as they're approaching their studio visits with their faculty and as they're thinking about their crits coming up, um, taking that feedback in, but also being yourself and kind of standing by your work is uh, excellent advice for them. And something um, that's not done too, like don't try to finish it, leave it undone because they might say something that improves it or helps it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're um, at time, and I want to thank you very much for sharing your work with us, giving us a behind-the-scenes look at your practice. Um, if it's okay with you, when you do have your first open studio, please share that date with us, and we'll let people on the call know when it's available, and we'll make sure that that word gets out so that people can come and visit you in Exeter and see your work. But I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And I'd especially like to thank you for, again, giving us this behind the scenes look at your practice. Oh, thank anytime. I want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their day to listen to me talk so fast. But, you know, it, I'm really enthusiastic about um, doing this and grateful that you guys all kind of tuned in. So and be in touch. My contact info isn't hard to find. So thank you.